from CBS News headquarters in New York. This is the CBS Evening News, with Dan Rather substituting for Walter Cronkite. And Peter Collins aboard the USS Blue Ridge. Ed Bradley in Manila. John Lawrence in Paris. Peter Kalisher in Da Nang. In Washington, Phil Jones, Bob Schieffer, and Hal Walker. Good evening. South Vietnam now is under communist control. Early today, beginning with a jeep load of rather ragtag Viet Cong soldiers, then truck after truck of heavily armed North Vietnamese regular troops, the communists entered Saigon in force. South Vietnamese President Duong Van, so-called big men, just two days in office, surrendered his government unconditionally. Communist tanks smashed through the heavy gates of the presidential palace, flew the Viet Cong flag overhead, and took men away in a jeep. His whereabouts are not known. The surrender came just four hours after the last Americans were pulled out of Saigon, now renamed by the Viet Cong Ho Chi Minh City. Here is the first film of that historic evacuation, Peter Collins reports. The sky over Saigon was filled with dozens of assorted aircraft, helicopters, transports, even fighter bombers in a nameless whirling merry-go-round over the city. The U.S. Embassy helicopters flew from roof to roof, plucking up stranded Americans and occasionally depositing them on the landing pad atop the embassy. But from the roof of the Caravelle Hotel in downtown Saigon, it looked as though every pilot in the South Vietnamese Air Force who could get his hands on an aircraft had decided that now was the time to get away. It was mid-morning when the word came. A full-scale emergency evacuation had been ordered. All Americans were to report immediately to assembly points designated weeks in advance. When buses arrived at the assembly points, they were soon jammed with anxious Americans and some Vietnamese who slipped aboard. Then came a hair-raising ride to the airport. American Marines brought in to guard the helicopter landing zone stayed close to bunkers as the steady thump of rockets and the clatter of small arms kept up throughout the day. The landing zone was the parking lot of what used to be the American military headquarters in Vietnam, once known as Pentagon East. But now, the huge building was a last-ditch holding area, while overhead, big Air Force and Marine helicopters arrived to land at intervals of about five minutes. Inside the building, the evacuees were broken into groups of 50, and then it was a mad dash out the door into the parking lot for the waiting helicopter. Although it seemed much longer, it took only two or three minutes to load the helicopters, and then it was farewell to Vietnam. To avoid the threat of surface-to-air missiles, the big chopper skimmed low over Saigon, with the door gunner at the ready and the engines deliberately set to produce a stream of white smoke so that any aircraft crews would have a hard time spotting it. It was a 45-minute ride from the encircled and threatened city of Saigon to the safety of American aircraft carriers waiting offshore. So, on the South China Sea, thousands of other Vietnamese were fleeing in an armada of boats, hundreds of vessels of all size, ranging from patrol boats to Vietnamese Navy warships, all making their way out to the American 7th Fleet and presumably hoping for an eventual voyage to the United States. On the midway, the refugees are led quickly away from the howling blast of the helicopters by Navy crewmen. For them, it is only the first leg in a journey away from Vietnam and the war, but perhaps an uncertain future in America. Peter Collins, CBS News, with the final American withdrawal from Vietnam. South Vietnamese military servicemen and their wives today continued to arrive in Thailand, apparently the last of an estimated 70,000 Vietnamese who fled their country just before the communist takeover. More on the flight from Saigon from Ed Bradley. The crowds of Americans and other foreigners lined up at installations around Saigon waiting for buses with the youth. It told the Vietnamese that this was the end of the line. For most of those who wanted to leave their country, this would be their last chance. Some Americans who pushed towards the bus tried to pull their Vietnamese wives and children along with them. There were desperate scenes with families separated and crying out for help, pleading not to be left behind, clutching at the last straw of hope. We rode through the streets of Saigon for more than four hours, unable to find a way out or anyone who could tell us where to go. At Thompson Airport, armed paratroopers turned our buses back, 
people. At one point, we were unloaded on the Saigon waterfront, where we could see American helicopters circling the city, and Vietnamese trying to escape on boats heading to the sea. No one wanted to be left in this crowd that at times was strangely quiet, but that always was on the verge of panic. We all decided to try and reach the United States Embassy, and once there, we found it surrounded by Vietnamese looking for a way in and a way out. Helicopters were landing on the roof and inside the compound as we walked to the back of the embassy. We had to push and shove our way through a crowd of several hundred Vietnamese trying to scale the walls, only to be knocked back by U.S. Marines. Once inside the compound, for the Americans and those Vietnamese who managed to get in with legal documents, and the many who managed entrance without, the rest was easy. It was just a matter of waiting your turn for a helicopter to take you to one of the ships on station off the Vietnamese coast. The American fleet had been having problems since the start of the evacuation, not with the arrival of South Vietnamese pilots and their helicopters loaded with family and friends. Hovering above the decks to unload their passengers, the pilots were unfamiliar with landing their craft on a moving ship. One crashed into the side of the USS Blue Ridge, others managed to crash land on the deck of the ship. For those that did manage to put down, they were simply pushed over the side and into the sea by U.S. sailors and marines to make room for the returning American craft based on that ship, filled with evacuees from Saigon. Other South Vietnamese pilots just hovered long enough to unload their passengers and then headed to the side of the ship and just jumped out with their life vests to be picked up by U.S. sailors, their helicopters crashing into the sea. Still other pilots headed out to the side of the ships after unloading their passengers and settled the craft into the water and then jumped out, again waiting to be picked up by U.S. sailors. Many hours later, as one of the last evacuees arrived, U.S. Ambassador Graham Martin, the final American ambassador stationed in South Vietnam. After so many long and bitter years, the American involvement in Vietnam was over. Ed Bradley, CBS News, Manila. Last Friday, former South Vietnamese Premier Nguyen Cao Ki exhorted his countrymen to remain in Vietnam even if the communists took over saying those who flee are cowards. Today, Key was reported on an American evacuation ship in the South China Sea after being taken from Saigon on an American helicopter. In the early hours today, between the American evacuation and the communist arrival, almost every building in Saigon that was abandoned by the Americans was looted. Chief among them was the U.S. Embassy, where everything was stolen from a paper shredding machine to, literally, the kitchen sink. Just before the communists entered Saigon, one government police colonel walked to an army memorial statue at the National Assembly, saluted it, then fatally shot himself. Elsewhere in the city, government soldiers threw away their guns, discarded their uniforms, and tried to melt back into the crowd. There were sporadic outbursts of gunfire as the communists marched into Saigon, some of it from die-hard government troops at the Presidential Palace and at the Saigon Zoo, some of it from celebrating Viet Cong soldiers. But overall, it was a well-disciplined, peaceful takeover. To the south and west of Saigon, however, the Viet Cong says that there still are eight provinces, quote, not yet liberated. We'll have a direct conversation with correspondent Ed Bradley by a satellite from Manila in a moment. What's that, Jack? A second flavor of Digel, new lemon orange. Now there are two Digel flavors. At times, you know how tired you get from the taste of some antacids. Oh, do I? Not with Digel, in regular mint or new lemon orange. Both work like no plain antacid can. How's that? Digel is different. Relieves occasional heartburn, acid indigestion. Gets rid of gas. Gas? Gas pressure. Fullness. Digel. In regular mint. And new lemon orange. I'll try it. Forty years ago, family getaway cars needed all the traction, handling, and gas mileage they could muster. Fortunately, there was a dual 10 from General Tire. Today, your getaway car needs even more traction, handling, and gas mileage. And fortunately, there's the 40,000-mile dual steel 2 radio from General Tire. CBS News correspondent Ed Bradley was among the last U.S. newsmen to leave Phnom Penh, Cambodia, when it fell. 
And then yesterday, he was among the last to leave Saigon, just before the South Vietnamese government surrendered. He is now in Manila. Ed, what are your more vivid recollections of those last hours in Saigon? I think perhaps the most vivid, Dan, was riding around the city of Saigon for almost four, five, perhaps better than five hours trying to find a way out. There was just utter confusion, almost total chaos. Uh, no one really knew where to take us because we were unable to get into Thompson at Air Base. The Arvin paratroopers turned us away and the uh, mission warden had no backup for us, no place else for us to go. So we just kind of wandered around the city for hours wondering if uh, indeed we were going to get out. Uh, but we eventually did get into the U.S. Embassy by climbing over a wall in the uh, back of the United States compound and, uh, and getting a helicopter out. Were some South Vietnamese also trying to get over that wall and get into the compound? Oh, there were hundreds at that wall and, and more than a thousand, several thousand in front of the embassy. At one time, uh, a grenade was thrown into a crowd. Uh, people were scaling the walls. Marines were at the top trying to knock them back at the, the front of the embassy and also at the back. Uh, people were just climbing on top of each other and, and just begging and pleading with any American they saw, anyone who was not a Vietnamese, uh, to help them, asking them to, to, to help me get out of here. Uh, there were really some very sad scenes there with, with parents saying, my children are already over the wall and I'm stuck outside, or children saying, my father went over the wall and what am I going to do? Uh, but at that point... The Marines were not letting anyone in who did not have proper credentials, if they could stop them. Uh, and it was a question of survival at that point. In the embassy itself, I know you were there for quite some time before being helicoptered out. Describe for us what you saw and what you felt in that embassy in those last hours. That was perhaps the strangest part of the day, Dan. I, I remember when I climbed over that wall and started walking towards the embassy inside the compound, I could see charred bills, American money. Uh, I, I don't know what bill it was. Andrew Jackson's face was on it. We picked some of them up and looked at it. There were two barrels uh, that had been filled with, with money and they were being burned. Uh, a few minutes later, I saw a man come out with, with a stack of money. It, it must have been that wide, maybe two, two and a half, three feet long, just uh, new money. I don't know if it was if it was legal or if it was counterfeit. I don't know what it was, but they were burning it. And I saw someone in the embassy later, a man that I knew, and I asked him what he did with that money. And he said to me, you won't believe it, but I destroyed four and three quarter million dollars today, all of it by burning. We went out in the hallway to the water fountain, and this hall runs the entire length of the embassy building, the main embassy building, quite a long hallway. And the hallway was, was very dark. There was very subdued lighting. And at the other end, there was a large conference room and the doors were open to that conference room and it was lit by fluorescent lights and there was an embassy official still sitting there giving orders to, to other U.S. officials concerned with the evacuation. And that was really the, the bright light. Uh, I just thought of the expression that we've heard and and used so many times the, the light at the end of the tunnel. And after walking out of that room and seeing those newspaper clippings and walking out and seeing the Vietnamese on the floor and walking down and seeing the light at the end of the hallway and, and thinking of that phrase, the, the light at the end of the tunnel, and that's the way America was leaving Vietnam. spray paint, what you want is a beautiful smooth finish without runs and drips. That's why I switched to Krylon. Look at this test. Krylon versus the other leading brand. See, the other brand is running, but Krylon's fast dry formula helps you avoid runs and drips. With Krylon, even an amateur can get a professional finish. Beautiful. Krylon for the beautiful professional finish. Choose a cereal. Who are you? I'm your common sense. Mm -hmm. And here's our common sense cereal. Kellogg's Product 19. Good, huh? Crunchy and smart. Gives us vitamin insurance. 100% of our daily allowance of 10 vitamins and iron. Tastes terrific. Right. What's terrific? 
my common sense. Make Kellogg's Product 19 your common sense cereal. President Ford has refused to give Congress copies of confidential correspondence between former President Nixon and former South Vietnamese President Q about U.S. aid after the Paris Peace Agreement. But today in Washington, a former member of the Q cabinet made public two letters. Phil Jones reports. The two letters were private correspondence between then-President Nixon and President Tu. On November 14, 1972, Mr. Nixon wrote, You have my absolute assurance that if Hanoi fails to abide by the terms of this agreement, it is my intention to take swift and severe retaliatory action. On January 5, 1973, as President Nixon was pressuring President Tu to accept the terms of the Paris Peace Agreement, Mr. Nixon wrote, you have my assurance of continued assistance in the post-settlement period and that we will respond with full force should the settlement be violated by the North Vietnamese. Earlier this month, when the controversy over secret agreements came up, the White House press office released several public statements by Mr. Nixon and spokesman Ron Nesson said that they were in substance the same as the private letters. These statements talked about vigorous reaction and that the U.S. would not tolerate violations. But there was nothing promising, quote, full force. And just this month, President Ford said he had reviewed all the correspondence and there was nothing different from what was stated publicly. Today, Nguyen Tien Hung, a former cabinet member of the two government, released the Nixon letters to two and indicated that the U.S. had not fulfilled a promise. To the Vietnamese, the assurances were backed up by the prestige and the credibility of the U.S. presidential office of its power under these conditions cannot be taken seriously than what can be. Tonight, the Ford White House says it was aware of these words, and as far as the president is concerned, this only reinforces the public, and if there's ever an issue that's academic, this is it. Bill Jones, CBS News, Washington. The White House today renewed its request for humanitarian aid for Indochina. It said the money is needed to pay for the evacuation of Vietnamese, to pay for their emergency care, and to help those still in South Vietnam through international relief organizations. The mass evacuation of Vietnamese has come under sharp criticism in Congress and elsewhere from those who question whether all of the refugees really needed to get out, and from some who say priority should have gone to Americans. But that criticism got short shrift today at the White House. Bob Schieffer reports. I took them out because they would have been killed otherwise, and I am proud that I did it. That direct quote, according to presidential spokesman Ron Nesson, is the president's response to some congressional critics who are suggesting he did not have the legal authority to use American combat troops to evacuate the loyal South Vietnamese from the war zone. Asked if he could cite some legal rationale for the president's move, Nesson said today he was citing moral rationale. And as additional justification, he read two newspaper editorials and offered to read the inscription on the Statue of Liberty. Nesson was in a snappish mood today, but White House aides said his sharp responses reflected accurately the president's own feelings on the subject. In the words of one top White House assistant, the president does not understand the lack of charity toward the refugees, and he does not understand all this niggling over legal niceties. Bob Schieffer, CBS News, the White House. Joan, where'd you put the bath oil? Right there. Right where? In the soap dish. There's soap in the soap dish. That's not soap, that's caress. So where's the bath oil? In the caress. Caress is the body bar with bath oil. 101 light, delicate drops blended inside to soften your skin every time you lather. Feel better now? I never felt better. Caress, the body bar with bath oil. Michelin, Michelin. Dear Michelin, we visit our family from Florida to Canada to Chicago and Denver. Your steel belted radios give us driving comfort and economy, but most of all, a feeling of security and safety. Ever since we invented the steel belted radial, Americans have been sold on Michelin. Prove it to yourself. Mrs. Shaft did. Michelin, the steel belted radial leader. We made it first. We make it last. Reaction among communist countries to South Vietnam's surrender was predictably quick in coming. In Hanoi, there was dancing in the streets, firecrackers and rockets exploded throughout the city. In Peking, there was singing and chanting. In Moscow, 
Tass had a satisfied note of inevitability, but only an oblique reference to American participation in the war and apparent concession to what is called detente with the West. In Paris, the South Vietnamese and the Viet Cong delegations displayed the two faces of a war that is over. John Lawrence has details. Vietnam's winners and losers showed their separate joys and fears in Paris today. At the headquarters of the provisional revolutionary government, the Viet Cong flag flying outside, the veteran communist revolutionaries quietly celebrated their forces' victory in Saigon. Inside, Ambassador Din Ba Thi delivered the new South Vietnamese government's first declaration. He said that foreign policy will be based on peace and non-alignment, that diplomatic relations will be established with all countries, regardless of politics, and that South Vietnam will accept economic and technical aid from any country as long as no political strings are attached. He called for an end to hates and divisions in South Vietnam. Scores of South Vietnamese showed up at the former Saigon government's embassy in Paris today, where business went on as usual. These Vietnamese, who owed their allegiance to the last government, flooded the staff with requests for new passports. As one explained, with the new situation, we don't know what our nationality will be. John Lawrence, CBS News, Paris. Just a month ago, on March 30th, the communists in their drive down the South Vietnamese coast captured the city of Da Nang. A day later, the Viet Cong shot this film, showing captured South Vietnamese military equipment. All of this part of millions of dollars worth of military equipment the United States provided South Vietnam's now defunct government. Equipment that was abandoned to the communists in that retreat by government troops. The Viet Cong says these films were shot in and around Da Nang. East German television, which provided this film, said more than 100,000 South Vietnamese soldiers surrendered to the communist forces in the Da Nang area. Peter Kalischer is in Da Nang now, and here is his report. Three thousand feet, this is the border town of Quang Tri on the 17th parallel and the Ben Hai River that divides north from South Vietnam. The countryside pocked with about $10 million worth of American bomb craters and shell holes. Looking down on the former imperial capital of Way on the Perfume River. This is what used to be the U.S. Air Force Base of Da Nang. At one time in 1966, the busiest airport in the world. That's right, in the world. More takeoffs and landings than Chicago's O'Hare International. Now it belongs to the Provisional Revolutionary Government of South Vietnam. Da Nang itself, South Vietnam's second city, population, according to the new management, of one million. 200,000 refugees are supposed to have fled. How many made it is uncertain. It is now living on former American supplies turned over to the Saigon forces, then captured by the Viet Cong, a term the Provisional Revolutionary Government does not like. The PRG, the Provisional Revolutionary Government, is taking a new census and asking everyone who came to Da Nang in the last 10 years to return to their village homes. Whether they like going back is as hard for an American to answer as the question of whether they really like their new regime. Peter Kalischer, CBS News, Da Nang. Oh, I got a 
Nothing, a heartburn or acid indigestion. Here, spoon it away. Ah, listen to me. Chew it away. McGivney, why don't you just wash it away? What? Try new alka seltzer gold. You drink new alka seltzer gold so it neutralizes excess acid fast and helps wash it away. Looks like you washed it away. You washed it away. I told you the boss was right. <laughs> Alka-Seltzer Gold washes excess acid away. President Ford has postponed for one month a scheduled one dollar per barrel increase in the tariff on imported oil, which had been due tomorrow. White House aides say this delay is to give Congress more time to consider its energy proposals. The federal government's new withholding tax rates go into effect tomorrow, meaning workers' paychecks will show a higher take-home pay. The overall effect of the tax cut will be to put an extra $7.8 billion in consumers' pockets over the rest of this year. This and the tax rebates, the first of which will be mailed out next week, are designed to help chances for economic recovery this year. The Dow Jones Industrial Average climbed more than 18 points on the New York Stock Exchange. Volume was 18,100,000 shares. The average price per share gained 50 cents on the New York Exchange, 8 cents on the American. The dispute over the role of women in the Episcopal Church today wound up in a Washington church court. Hal Walker was there. The faithful and the curious gathered inside St. Columbus Church today, not for worship, but for the church's first ecclesiastical trial in this diocese in the 20th century. The defendant, Father William Wendt, rector of St. Stephen in the Incarnation Church, a popular and controversial priest, whose ecclesiastical crime is that he permitted a woman to celebrate Holy Communion in his church. That woman, Mrs. Allison Cheek, was among 11 who took part in a contested ordination service in Philadelphia last July. Father Wendt argues that the ordination was valid and that the women are authorized to function as priests. The church never recognized the ordination. The church court will have to decide the rector's fate. He is charged with disobeying the godly admonition of his bishop. Washington Bishop William Creighton, however, had trouble defining just what a godly admonition is. It's not like a general's order, he conceded, but he had better luck telling what it wasn't than what it was. The defense summoned a number of theological experts to support Reverend Wendt's position that he did not violate the spirit of church law. He says the issue is clear-cut. Simply and purely that the authority of God is greater than the authority of man, plus the fact that 11 women were ordained godly priests in Philadelphia on July 29th, 74. And that's what's being fought here. That's it. Hal Walker, CBS News, Washington. For CBS News, Dan Rather in New York. Thank you for joining us. Good night. Whole grain wheat. Hard red spring wheat. Whole grain rye. Whole grain means that the wheat germ and rye germ are still there. This is bran. This defatted flax seed, and this is pure golden honey. Now, all of these ingredients are in Roman meal bread. Roman meal, the good tasting light brown bread with natural whole grain goodness. The Roman meal company thought you'd like to know. Whether you drive in the city or under big sky, if you're a smart buyer, the tire to buy is happening. This brand has a smooth ride. And mileage? Oh, yeah. Plus, sure-footed handling to get you there. That's Atlas. Especially when the roads are rough, Atlas tires show their stuff. Built to go where the going's tough. That's Atlas. Steel radial belt in or floor fly. Where do you get these quality tires? At service stations near you. So be a smart buyer. Get Atlas. From CBS News headquarters in New York, this has been the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather substituting for Walter Cronkite. For the latest news early, watch the CBS Morning News with Hughes Rudd. Monsters of the Deep, tonight at 8, 7 central on CBS. Channel 5, first to go live. Good evening, I'm Chris Clark. In the news tonight, Warden Jim Rose says 500 inmates should be released from the state penitentiary in Nashville soon. John Dean, and we'll have local reaction to the fall of... This is Channel 4, WSM-TV, Nashville, Tennessee, 530.